good idea. And um, nice. It is six o'clock. So yeah, if it is anybody about recording, just accept, say yes. Um, and so we really, let me find, where's our fearless leader? I'm trying to find you, Nancy, to spotlight you. Oh, there you are. Oh, here okay. I are. Waving. And so let's spotlight for everyone. Oh, <laughs> uh, you do the spotlight. And every time I see myself, I think, oh, I look just like my brother. Um, <laughs> this is not good. So, okay, we're going to start with, uh, first, we're going to start with um, the joke from Maxine. Oh, okay, then let me find Maxine and get her up here too. Oh, there she mm -hmm. is. I just passed her. Mm -hmm. That's all right. You can pass me again. No, no, no. You're beautiful. Come on, get over here. <laughs> okay, you ready? So this elderly man buys a sports car to recapture his youth. And there he is driving on the highway at 120 miles an hour. And he hears, woo, 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 and a cop stops him. And the cop says to him, you know, you were speeding. And, and then the cop says, I have 10 minutes left on my shift. If you give me a really good story, I'll let you go. The guy says, well, my wife ran off with a cop and I thought you were, you were the guy she ran off with and you were gonna return her. Cop says, okay, you're free. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who don't know, Maxine tells a joke at the beginning of all meetings. So that's kind of a, um, a given. Um, okay, a couple of announcements. So couple announcements. Um, we're looking forward to the Twin Cities Bead Bazaar this it, coming weekend. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think... Um, Is Becky making an announcement about that or who? Becky, do you have anything to add about any um, uh, volunteers you need? Um, actually, I have two for each of the ships, so I'm fine. Thank you. Okay. So I guess we're okay with that. Um, the next um, activity we have, which um, quite a few of you don't know about, um, we have been invited to um, a beating event in uh, Rochester with um, Chris Allen and um, uh, Margaret, Margo. Margo, Margo, you. Margo Yi. Yi. There you go. Okay. I, I couldn't print it off. My printer's having <laughs> a uh, throwing a temper tantrum. Um, and we, uh, Jan will be posting it on our website. Um, the details of, of um, what we're going to do. Basically, we're going to get together and do some beating and go out to the um, the community garden where um, Chris does her um, beating. Um, we're going to be working, before we go there, we're gonna be um, at the museum and we're going to be working on that um, sunflower rock that Rochelle has a picture of. And uh, Rochelle, you want to give them the details sure. about the kits? And so I'm, the whole Sunflower Rock Garden project is started because we want to a, raise awareness for um, um, Ukraine. And so that's why we um, have gotten the sunflower motif. But the Beaded Rock Garden um, inspiration um, for having a permanent installation versus just these temporary ones um, so that they can continue to support the Rochester Garden Project um, with their photography and their cards to help sell to support the garden and bring awareness as well. And we thought we could start the um, uh, rock garden installation of our sunflower rocks at the state fair 
um, in one of our cases or in the display case in front of where we're sitting all day so that we could show off as well and try to bring the awareness through the project through our state fair showing as well as through the garden. And so I beaded one um, in colors of the kits that I made that I thought were good sunflower colors. This is the back of my pretty rock. It's just a basalt rock from the North Shore that I had in my garden. And then all the flowers I did here are representations of the different classes we've taken. This one on the back is the one that actually Chris taught during the class. And then this one here is Hannah Rosner's toggle pattern that she taught. And then I just turned it into the flower instead. And then this one here um, is the one from the fairy. It's the base of the fairy. So anybody who made the fairy, that's exactly how Nancy Jenner wrote it for the base. And then all these little petals is exactly how I made the drops for the Murray's Dagger necklace. So if you look at the last four months of classes that we have taught, all the bases of these kind of flowers are basically in all those classes. And then also Nancy or Chris taught us how to do the peyote connections. And so I couldn't wait that long to do the peyote. So I actually did right angle weave ropes and then filled them in with peyote and it worked 10 times faster. <laughs> So anyway, so that's why we thought we'd start the project, um, you know, at our field trip and all do it. And if you want it, I did make kits that have 36 grams of bees. So it's 11 O's and 8 O's in the yellow, green and brown. So if you wanted to do them in the exact same colors, you could. Um, and then it has green thread and the size 11 Toho needle. And so I was selling the kits at the Bead Bazaar this weekend and at Bobby Bead for $10. And then all the proceeds will go to the Rochester Garden and the World Central Kitchen. So it's all going to help feed the world through the two different projects. Um, and so if you want, I will be at the Bead Bazaar um, in the Team Toho booth. And um, so we'll have, I only have 26 kits left at the moment, but I have beads coming to make more. So um, if they sell out this weekend, I will have more for the 18th. So we hope you can join us. Oh, and Roberta is being part of the ride share coordination for the 18th trip so that um, we can all get carpooled and all get down to Rochester, anybody who's in the area. And um, so if you wanna be a driver or you need a ride, contact Roberta Sorensen. Um, and then, cause I did talk to Sandra Rothers today and she lives, I can't remember, she lives like halfway between, she's willing to drive, anybody in area. So if you're willing to drive or you need a ride, um, like I said, we want to coordinate to get everybody there. Yep. Okay. And Roberta can be, if you don't have her email address, she can be reached through a link on um, our website. Yep. Yep. And the, and the date is May 18th. May 18th. Yep. And so, and then we do have Beating Basics Live coming up which is the following Saturday. So I know it's a whole lot in one week, but the 18th, um, um, what do you call it? The 18th is our Beating Basics Live and I'm teaching um, the, what's it called? Diamond Demi Duo. So that's what it looks like is, so you do the base of it with the Demi's and then those diamonds pop together three dimensionally. So that way you pop the gem duo right on top and the little 11s kind of act Very like cool. prongs. So if you do it every single one, it looks like that. And if you do it every other one, it looks like that. So it's a really fun project. So I'm teaching this third that day on the 18th. Hannah okay. Rosner is second that day. Um, and so I'm not sure if Hannah, do you have a picture of your thingy lady? 
Um, I'll get it up there, but just to let you know, um, the 18th is actually a Wednesday. You know, the 21st, I mean, sorry. The 18th is yep. the project, is our field trip. The 21st is the basics, be live. Yes, exactly. And um, I will get a picture of... I know you sent the pattern to everybody. I just didn't know if you're showing it. Yeah. And then okay. I know you guys are a little crazy and you're like, well, if you're second and you're third... Who's first? So what we're trying to do is get Kim Tamron to teach us all how to do basic Kumi on a Meridai first that day. So this is Kim Tamron. It's Adrian Gaskell's partner in crime in some of her Kumi-like <laughs> land. And so no pressure here. We to put her on the spot I there. I know <laughs> she's a BFF, so I can do that. So anyway, so everybody give her encouragement. And so hopefully she'll be teaching our basic Kumi that day. Otherwise, so say hi, Kim. <laughs> I know. You I know. Kim. That's you okay. look so happy about that. Hi, Kim. I know she's going to think about it this weekend and let us know. And Hannah's going to go over with her and show her how easy it is and how much fun it is after watching Adrian tonight to do all the like hard stuff. And then she'll show us like the how to. So <laughs> think about it, Kim. Otherwise, we will have to find another first person. <laughs> so. I know y'all have to deal with me. That's just the way it is when you made me the program coordinator. That's and that's you're doing a fine job. So just other than a that, magnificent job. I'm not sure where she went. Our 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 mistress of the night. Where did she go? Where oh, there's Adrian. <laughs> okay. Um, just a couple more announcements. Yep. Yep. Um, just to put on your calendar, um, September 21st through the 25th are the dates for our fall retreat at Camp Wapple in Amory. Um, that's a Wednesday through Sunday. You'll get more information as it, time comes closer. Um, the last thing I have is we have done a, um, drawing for um, some Toho mini kits. Challenge kits. Yeah. And uh, Barb Benjamin sent me these four names and they will be, um, I suppose they, you want them to contact you, Rochelle? Um, I will they'll either be picking them up from me um or they will be because i'll have your kit here at the shop or i can mail them to you if you don't live around here or if you want to be at the bead bazaar i can give them to you at the bead bazaar it's up to you so yeah contact me at bobby bead or my email or my cell phone whatever way you like okay so our four um people that are going to be getting Toho kits, the, the mini challenge kit are Barb Doomer, um, Suzanne Stephenson, Tia Pearson, and Paulette Mazurek. I know Paulette's oh. on this meeting. Oh, <laughs> so we will have to mail it, I know, to Paulette because oh she's not in town. That's no, exciting. but she's right here. There she is. Yes. So we will mail you okay. your kit. Okay. That's yeah. exciting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's about the extent of anything that I have to say for the meeting. So Rochelle, you get to take it on. Oh, I, I'm just trying to get, here we go, spotlight for everyone. We have our amazing Adrienne Gaskell today. She is the Kumuhimo goddess of the world. And <laughs> so we're just so darn excited. She's going to tell us all about the history of Kumuhimo from past to present. And so I'm going to mute myself. And if you, anybody has questions, you can write them in the chat. Or um, maybe if she wants to unmute and ask, what would you prefer, Adrian? Whichever is okay. fine. Sounds okay. Super. 
All right, great. Okay, let me get my presentation up and running. Oops, first I have to share my screen. Okay. Uh, all right. Okay, everybody can see my screen, I assume, at this point. Okay. So tonight I'm gonna to talk a little bit about Kumihimo from past to present. Um, I think the long, long history of Kumihimo can be a little uh, less than interesting, especially in a presentation like this, but I really think it's um, important for people to know some of the events that took place over time. So this is just to give you a brief overview here that in the 1600s is when the samurai were popular and that was when the height, the heyday, I should say, of um, Kumihimo. And then in 1970, we have this book that was published and I'll talk a little bit more about that during the presentation. And then in 2016, I don't know if any of you have heard of this movie, but it was uh, an anime movie in Japan and it was the largest grossing anime movie ever. And it featured children doing Kumihimo in the movie. And that had a really incredible effect on Kumihimo with young people because young people in Japan do not really know what Kumihimo is. <clears throat> However, after that movie came out and was so popular, Makiko Tada and others wrote many books geared towards young people. And I think it's really helped uh, have kind of a resurgence because people don't really um, know Kumihimo the way most people assume they do in Japan. <clears throat> Excuse me. Okay. So I think most people know that it Kumihimo is an ancient Japanese braiding technique and that braiding was popular uh, in many, many cultures in ancient times. The first recorded history of Kumihimo is for, during the Jomon period in Japan, which dates from about 8,000 BCE to 300 BCE. Jo means rope or twisted cord and mon means pattern. So the cord markings on this pottery, you can't tell that well, but right there are actually impressions done with braided cords. And this um, type of work is what differentiates or distinguishes the, this period from the er, early, earlier Paleolithic age. So the word yeoman literally is that whole period was named for the discovery of the first evidence of Kumihimo. Okay. So that braid that's on the pottery is actually a braid that we refer to in Japanese as Mariyotsu. And Mariyotsu uh, is a four ply braid. And this is a, a close up of impressions on pottery and how they were recreated to know what braid it was. And this is the hand movements for the Mariyotsu braid. And it's the first braid in Makiko Tada's Maradai book. And so this is still a braid that's done today. And not only is it done today, it's used extensively for a lot of different work. Kamiko Kakimoto wrote this book in 1999. And this <laughs> book was the first book that really showed um, traditional Kumihimo braids using beads. Um, and it was, very, very rare at this point, still kind of is in Japan, to see traditional Kumihimo incorporating beads into the braid. And nearly every um, piece in this book has beads in it. 
And this book is not a book to learn Kumi Himo. It was, it's really uh, Kamiko-san's life work. So it's basically a, law, a gallery of just incredible, inspiring photos. I have some of these books. It's out of print, but um, Makiko Tada's husband was able to find where the publisher had the last books. And so he was able to buy brand new books for me. And I've been selling them on my website now for about a year. I think I have a couple left. Anyway, if you ever want to get inspired, this book is incredible. So this is some of her works uh, at an exhibition. And the, these, this here is all the Mariozzo. These, she uses it a lot in her tassels. All of this is Mariozzo, as are these. This is a necklace that I created after meeting um, her and seeing these works in person. And so it was Beautiful. inspired by her, um, the artist and the book. Now, the first documentation of beading, beaded kumihimo is from this beaded sash belt from the Asuka period, which is somewhere between 592 and 710 AD. And you can see how this is so deteriorated because of things are from that long ago. But you can actually see glass beads worked into the braid that are still there. And this is the first um, recorded uh, piece of history that they found the beads, which are all along in this piece here. So I'm always fascinated because I'm first a bead artist and second uh, kumihimo artist, but I love to see beads and kumihimo because people tell me that's not traditional, but yet here it is. Okay, so how were these ancient braids made? Well, back then they didn't have Mara dye or Taka dye or any equipment. So the braids were all done by loop manipulation and using your fingers and your toe, uh, your fingers and your hands. So <clears throat> this is when very complex braids started to emerge. We got past the four ply braid and now we're getting into braids that are using, you know, 12, 16, 24 strands to make these braids. And some of these, if they had that many um, strands in them, or what we refer to now kind of as warps, they would require more than one person to work on the braid because you'd have to hold the loops over your fingers. So this is a, a painting um, showing a woman using this very rudimentary piece of equipment. So what happens here is when she needs to tighten the point of braiding here, this part is all braided and then this part is her free cords. So she uses her foot and that moves this and it beats the point of braiding to tighten the tension and to keep it a consistent tension as she's working. So although she would normally, if she were really braiding, have those loops that are sticking out of her hand right here on her fingers. Because Kumihimo was very secretive at that point, she's not holding them on her fingers because she doesn't want anyone to know exactly what she's doing. So she's holding them in her hands, not the way she would have held them when she was actually braiding. This is a picture from Makiko Tata's book and where she writes a very detailed history of Kumihimo. <clears throat> okay, now we move into between the 14th to the 17th century and Kumihimo becomes fashion, used as fashion and ornamentation. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you've seen uh, kimonos today, they have a wide obi fabric around them, which I'll show you with um, an obijime on top. The obijime is made out of kumihimo, but back this older obi is the Nagoya obi, and that really is just cords wrapped around, as you can see how it's tied in the back here, and we don't have the wide fabric obi at this point. Then 
Next comes the Edo period when they have over a half a million samurai in Edo. Edo is the name of what is the old name for Tokyo. And so during this period is the rise of the samurai and the rise of Kumihimo. This is when Kumihimo was the most uh, popular and there were thousands of Kumihimo artisans around Japan. So because one samurai armor needed over a thousand feet of braids. So I don't know if you can tell here, but each one of these is a braid and they're looped around um, either metal plates, this one looks metal, sometimes it was leather. And so you can see there's just thousands of feet of braids on this. Of course, they're also used on the sword handles. And then this would be the rope that would tie the sword around the waist and the body of the samurai warrior. Who got to learn fighting? Was it the upper classes? Was it passed from the family member to family member? Well, it was not necessarily the, the upper class. The people that were doing Kumihimo at this point were artisans. And they, I mean, they were craftspeople. And so the craft was passed from one teacher to a pupil, not necessarily within a family, but you had to be um, willing to dedicate your life to this work for someone to um, actually teach you Kumihimo. So in other words, you wouldn't just go learn it as a pastime. If you were somebody that was wanting to go into this field and learn Kumihimo so that you could dedicate your life to this type of work, then you would find that maybe one of the Kumihimo uh, artisans would take you on as an apprentice and would teach you Kumihimo. Okay, so now in 1876, the sword abolishment edict was passed, and this would greatly impact the future of Kumihimo. So they decided at that point, the government, that they did not want people walking around with swords and they tried to have a time of peace and uh, no more fighting amongst all the warlords. So they did not allow um, people in public to carry weapons and suddenly there's no more samurai and no more need for artisans to make these thousands and thousands of feet of Kumihimo. <laughs> so, what happens next? Well, now Kumihimo becomes a more popular as adornment. Now, one of the reasons that um, this wide obi, this is just a little side bit, it really doesn't have to do with kum Kumihimo, but the reason this wide obi became popular was because if a woman were wearing this wide obi, because men don't have a wide obi on their kimono, they would not be able to walk as fast as a man. And so the wide obi was introduced and then the kumihimo was placed on top of the obi. So this is called ob obi jime because jime means to bring together. So that was put on top to hold the obi in place, but it also became very decorative. And so kumi, um, kimonos started changing the way they were worn um, for a lot of different reasons. But one of them was this whole thing of trying to keep women from walking as fast as a man and making sure she walked behind him in her proper place. <laughs> Okay, now Kumihimo also became very popular with the rise of the tea ceremony because the pots that are used for this tea ceremony must be kept in a cloth bag and the cloth bag has to be sealed with this particular type of Kumihimo. So this was um, another way that the Kumihimo was being used at this point. Now, 
we asked about uh, learning Kumihimo. Well, historically, the Kumihimo schools did not have textbooks or any written materials for study. The students had to observe the sensei, which is what Japanese for teacher, and repeat everything until they mastered these techniques. So in other words, you would have to do maybe that four strand braid for two or three months until you could basically do it in your sleep without looking. And then you could advance to a more difficult braid and on and on, and that's how they would teach. And the admission to these schools was limited to only serious artisans. Somebody couldn't just go take the class because they wanted to learn Kumihimo. And this was true up until the late 70s. Um, however, due to a drop in demand, the Kumihimo school started opening their doors to hobbyists as well as artisans. And this is where you'll start seeing some of the people um, from Britain uh, were able to come and study at some of the Kumihimo schools, but not until um, this point would, would they allow a foreigner to come into the schools. So now we're getting into really complex braids at this point. So these are the five pieces of equipment that are used for Kumihimo. Uh, there's the Mara dye, which people probably have seen, but the Kukadai, Kakadai here is um, the braid actually goes upward while you're braiding. And this is used to make um, braids that have a nice twist in them. And then there's the Takadai, which makes the flat braids that are generally worn for an Obijime, although Obijime braids are also made on the Mara dye. And then Ayatakadai is another one. We call these feathers. And these um, use a different type of fiber, as does the Karakumi dye. Karakumi um, silk is twisted in um, one in a certain direction. I, I can't think it's I, I can never remember how to say it if it's clockwise or counterclockwise. But anyway, there's a twist in the in the Karakumi um, silk which makes the braids made on this look very interesting and much different than a braid made on the other pieces of equipment. So now we talk about how and why Kumihimo traveled outside of Japan. Well, there were two events that greatly impacted the spread and popularity of Kumihimo outside of Japan. And initially it became popular with weavers particularly. So up until the 1970s, like I said, there were no out of uh, foreigners allowed to study in the schools. And during, in, in 1976, that it, that's the most accurate date we can place on this book. Makiko Tata doesn't even remember when this book was written. But when this book was written, which we refer to as the white book, which was all in Japanese, it was the first time you saw drawings emerge. So this is, um, oh, I spelled her name wrong. <clears throat> Ayako um, has, was Makiko's mother. And so Ayako started writing the books. Makiko was her editor and did all the graphics for her. And this one doesn't have Makiko's name on it, but she was very, um, involved in all of these books. But this is the first time we see this type of drawing that we have now grown to expect for Kumihimo, the circle with the dots around it and the dots representing, um, for her, it was representing the Tama. But today we even see that written for the disc when you don't have Tama, that it's really just representing each of the warp cords. So this again is the Mariyotsu braid that she is showing here in the book. Um, and then there were three books written by Makiko and her mother. And there was the white book, the pink book and the green book during this time. There was another book that was written by somebody else. And I can't remember what color that one was, but another Japanese person jumped on the bandwagon and wrote one. Now, when Makiko's mother wrote this book, in 1976, she was got a lot of grief 
from Kumihimo artists in Japan because they were very upset that she was sharing these secrets. She was not a popular person for writing this, although the book was hugely popular and it made it outside of Japan. And I still hear from uh, people, mostly in England, I think it took longer to get to the United States for some reason, but in England, that book was something that was cherished and it sold like crazy. Then in 2002, this is the second event that really impacted the popularity of Kumihimo. Makiko Tada invented the Kumihimo disc, and then in 2003, she invented the plate. With these, she also published a book on the disc and plate. And these um, probably had to be um, the biggest factor in the popularity of beaded kumihimo because once these came into being and we could now do kumihimo without any of that big expensive equipment this made it so everybody could do it and so many people are now uh, making discs and plates but makiko tada invented it she was the first one to make it and unfortunately because it was made in japan many people for lack of a better word, kind of ripped her off and reproduced it and made it in other places. So now here's Kumihimo in everyday life. We're really coming into it. This is the new Apple Watch, if you've seen it, that is a Kumihimo watch band. Um, some people who work for Apple in their technology and development area came to Tokyo and took classes from Makiko Tada and she taught them how to do this braid. And they um, invented this special elastic uh, material. It's not something that we have access to, unfortunately, so we can't make our own watch band. Um, but they, Apple then made this band based on what they learned from Makiko Tada. We have Kumihimo coming into fashion. I mean, just, wonderful new things being done with Kumihimo as the central part. Kumihimo is being done in art. This is a window uh, storefront in New York. I don't know the store, unfortunately, but this is a close up of all the braids that are hanging in the windows. And then we have Kumihimo in industry. And I'm gonna show you a little video right now. This is a machine that was invented by Makiko Tada. For those of you who don't know, she's a engineer and this is her PhD uh, thesis. So this machine only uses gears. It does not use any computers. And this is all made out of composite materials. So they are very lightweight. So these braids are used in aircraft. They can be used on aircraft because they're so lightweight because of the composite materials. Uh, carbon fiber and different types of material are used. And then they're also used today, there's other uh, machines that have been invented to um, take the, make them into big wide, like two foot wide braids and they're used to uh, pour concrete into to use for supports for bridges and roads. So, arigato gozaimasu to Nancy and Rochelle for allowing me to share this information with you tonight. And then if anybody would like to know a little bit about uh, something I do every month, uh, which is called the Kumi U Club. And this is something that I um, offer classes on my website once a month live for $20 a month you get two classes and you also get access to my um, website which has lots of classes from the past that you can look at 
um, over 40 classes, I think I have on there now that once you join the Kumi U Club, you will have access to. So anybody who has any questions on that? Okay, thank you. There was a, there was a couple questions here. Where did I see it? Um, sorry, I'm scrolling back through. Um, where did I go? <laughs> everybody's <laughs> talking, everybody's talking, 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 talking. Um, and so it was talking about who got to learn how to braid. Was it just the upper classes? Was it anybody or? It was um, only the people who would dedicate their lives to making kumihimo because in Japan, you're not considered an artisan unless you are planning to do that your whole life, you know? So even today, like if you see, um, they have what they call national treasures. And these are generally people that are pretty old in their eighties, for instance, and they will have been someone who dedicated their life to doing say kumihimo and generally a very specific type. So maybe they worked on a takadai and they were considered the master of takadai braiding and they would become a national treasure. So this is what the kind of thing people were um, looking to do is that they would become experts in their field. It wasn't something that would necessarily be a class issue as much as it would be that you were really dedicating yourself to the craft. So could you be an apprentice then for so many years or how? Oh, I, yeah, definitely. You would, you would apprentice for a very long time before you would be working on your own. Yeah, I, it would just depend on the individual for even, for instance, even today in the Domeo school, which is probably the most well-known of, of the Kumihimo schools in Japan, you'll go and you'll work on one braid, say for three to six months before you're allowed to advance to the next braid. <laughs> and so then what's the first braid that you're taught? It's just with less strands or is it? Yes. Yeah, you'll start with, you know, usually an eight strand braid and believe it or not, you're only gonna learn um, traditional Japanese braids. And that word tradition has a different meaning to a Japanese person than it does to us. For instance, when I first started doing kumihimo, I thought traditional meant old. Well, it doesn't. What it means is it's something that follows a certain rhythm in the braid. So in other words, kongo, which is the round braid that many people use to do bidi kumihimo, is not a traditional braid. And the reason it's not a traditional braid is the braid goes all in one direction. You're always working clockwise on that. A traditional kumihimo braid, the moves mirror each other. So in, in other words, like the one I showed you, Mara Yotsu, you, you go, first move is clockwise, the second move is counterclockwise. So that's what's um, considered. So even today, the Domio school does not teach Congo. They will only teach traditional braids. Uh, Adrian, talk about um, the seven chord braid. The seven chord braid is not kumihimo. The seven chord braid is from ply splitting. And I believe that originated somewhere in Europe. I don't know. I don't know that much about it, honestly. I just know it's not kumihimo and it didn't originate in Japan. Okay, thanks. I just, I didn't know anything about it either. And I thought maybe you would know more. Well, if you want to look, uh, there's a little bit about the history of it, I believe. Shirley Berlin is kind of um, thought to be the expert of the seven strand braid. And she wrote a bit on the Braid Society website that I think anybody can see. That's the one in um, the UK. And I believe it's just braidsociety.org. I might have a the before it. Um, and there's more information. I, I, I know it's something European. You know, it's not something I'm, I do, so I'm not that <laughs> well versed in it, sorry. Okay, well, that's all right, thanks. Um, I don't remember when I first started doing Kumihimo, but it was an interesting way that it came into my life. I, um, for those of you who know me, know I used to be a bead weaving teacher when I first started teaching at Bead and Button 
19, 20 years ago, I taught bead weaving. And um, I also had students where I lived in Miami and I had one person who was a private student and she would bring me different pictures of things and say, can you teach me this? Can you teach me this? You know, not that she wanted to copy the piece, but she wanted to know the technique. So I'd teach her right angle weave and show it how it go, peyote, blah, blah, blah. And one day she brought me some braids because she thought that they were beaded braids and she thought they were, uh, uh, you know, bead weaving. And I said, you know, that's kumihimo and I don't really do that. And she said, wow, it's really cool. And I said, yeah, it is nice. And I, at the time I kind of wanted to get into um, bead crochet because I love the look of the bead crochet ropes. And I was really having a hard time mastering that. So I found out about a class on kumihimo because I thought the beaded Congo looked very similar to a bead crochet rope. And um, I went and took a class. The people had just learned how to do it, who taught it in the bead store. So they really didn't know much about it. But the one good thing that happened is they taught it on a Mara die. And I think that was my saving grace. And then I learned how to do that. And I learned how to do what I call continuous beaded braids or beads as fiber. And then I went home and spent the next three months really figuring it out because they didn't know anything about counterweight or so many things they didn't weren't able to show me or teach me because they didn't really understand it. The girl who was teaching the class said, I don't really know. I really teach chain mail. <laughs> A little different than chain mail. So then um, I made friends, phone friends with Jana Saunders at uh, Braider's Hand who make the best Mara dye. And the Mara dye they make at Braider's Hand in Washington are better than the, the Mara dye that I can purchase in Japan. They're better quality. Um, and they also make better quality Takadai than the ones that I could I purchase in Japan. So my Maradai and Takadai are from Braider Sand. But um, the, anyway, I made phone friends with Janice and I would call her and pick her brain because she knew so much more about Kumihimo than I did. And so we'd have these hour long conversations every other week or something. And one day she said to me, you know, Adrian, Makiko Tata is gonna be uh, teaching at Convergence in Tampa, not far from you. You should go take a class. And I said, yeah, but you know, I, I don't really wanna learn fiber. And Makiko teaches fiber. I wanna, I just wanna do beads, <laughs> you know? I'm a bead weaver. And she goes, you know, Adrian, you're doing a fiber craft. You should learn it on fiber and that would help your beading be better. And I went, duh, I think you're a little smarter than I am. And so I went and took a, a week long class with Makiko. We instantly, I loved her because she was so, she always encourages people to try new things. She's not traditional at all, if you've ever seen her work. She really pushes it and says, you know, we're making new traditions. Don't worry about what the tradition is. <laughs> and so she, on the second day, she said to me, you like braids, braid with beads, you know? And she showed me some of her braids and how to work beads into them. And then um, it just changed my life. And so then after that, I hired her to come teach in Miami for five days. And she stayed with me. Um, that was probably a year or so later. I don't know, time just keeps rolling along. <laughs> and she stayed with me and we were just great friends after that. And I had her for 10 days. And then she invited me to Japan. And that's when I went to Japan for the first time. And Kim and I met up in Kyoto after I spent a week at Makiko's. And it was really lovely to be with her and her husband and her family. And we've become very good friends since then. And that's the history of me and Kumihimo. And it just, it's, it fascinates me so much because you know, bead weaving, metal work, all the other things I've done before, there's really nothing new. I mean, we're all learning the same thing over and over and over again, right? With Kumihimo, the birth of, from what I showed you, the history of it, of for jewelry making and beading and all of that is really so new, you know? And so there's still things that we can discover. There's still things that I can invent, which I didn't find I had that with bead weaving and metalwork, which metalwork was my first love. And then I went into 
bead weaving after that. So I feel like I can still do new things and invent new techniques with Kumihimo. And that's what really um, inspires the engineer in me. <laughs> What's the favorite new thing you're doing right now with it? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I just am always doing something. I don't know. Uh, the last class I taught for the American Kumihimo Society is what I'm wearing, which is having dangles uh, on Kumihimo. Is that uh, putting it on during while you're braiding or is the dangles done after? No, I, I do everything while I'm braiding, you know? So I, that's my goal is to always figure out how to do it while I'm braiding. So just like the feathers are all braided in, um, everything is done while I'm braiding. Mm -hmm. So generally to me, it's something that, you know, something I see, I saw a necklace years ago that had feathers in it and I thought, how can I do, how can I braid feathers into a braid? And I had to figure out how to turn a feather into a bead. <laughs> so yeah, it's always the question in the engineering that inspires me to do some new technique. So you make the feathers on the thing first, you don't buy them already attached with something on there, you process them all yourself? Yep. Wow. These come on a, I bought these in the garment district in New York and they come on this long piece of like bias tape. And mm -hmm. so I cut them off that and I have all these little individual feathers that I make into these. But then you have to attach them to the thread somehow. And so that's another secret class. Yeah. <laughs> that you teach in your Wednesday Kumi U ones. That's one of those things. No, this was a master class project. And so I have not, uh, all my master class projects are being put together for a publication. Oh, and yay. so they are not being shared in my Wednesday classes because whenever I taught them, I taught seven years of master classes at Bead and Button mm -hmm. on Kumihimo. And um, there's so many of those that I have because in each year that I did a master class, I generally teach more than one project. Mm -hmm. So then there's a question for you. More than a coffee table book. This is a whole <laughs> series. I mean, we've been doing this a while. Yeah. That's Rochelle, can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Have you heard of Alicia Donathan? Uh-huh. Yeah, she used to teach. I took a class way back in the 90s from her at Bead and Button. Yeah, she, and she lived in Japan. I mean, in um, yeah. Hawaii, Hawaii, right? In Hawaii, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was the first Kumihimo I did. And I did a few, and then the, the disc came out, and that changed everything. <laughs> right. It was she so much easier to work on. Yeah, she yeah, taught on Mara I, I in the basement. <laughs> and um, also uh, Sheila Clary would teach on the Mara mm -hmm. as well. Uh, she had her one braid that she was she did on the Mara mm -hmm. And then Jill mm -hmm. Wiseman and then other people, of course, started teaching on the disc. But yeah, when I first started teaching and being button, the disc really hadn't been invented yet. Right. That was a very interesting class, but man, it changed a lot when that disc came out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, you know, um, the disc changed everything, really. And so now um, when I, <clears throat> when I teach, I'm, initially when I was teaching in Bean Button, I was primarily Maradai because I felt so many people were doing the disc and I was you know, became famous for being one of the few that did it on the Maradai. Um, but now all my classes that I teach virtually are geared to both the disc and the Maradai. Yeah. Oh. Most of the things I do, you can do on either. Yeah. Now I'm going to do that thing with Chewy and uh, the neighbor. Oh. oh, and Hannah says, would I like to tell you about my upcoming trip to Japan? Well, Kim, Tamarin is my partner in crime, as Rochelle says. Her. I'm finding her. I'm looking for her. She's here somewhere. She there probably she is. muted her video, so I can't see her. There oh, she here is. you are. Thank you. So uh, Kim and I, uh, that first year, 
we were uh, staying in Kyoto together and we have so many friends individually that are Japanese people that we knew that were showing us parts of Japan and things in Japan that we felt tourists really weren't seeing or appreciating. Um, so we decided we wanted to take people to Japan and show them you know, what they wouldn't see as a normal tourist. And so over the years, we've even made more friends. Like for our, for our last trip, we went to the uh, Tulip Needle Factory. And it was the first time Tulip had ever given a tour behind the scenes of their factory. And they did it because of our relationship with Toho. And Kim, of course, is the one who had the relationship with Toho because of her um, years of having Tambrook beads. Whereas I had the relationship on the Kumihimo side with Hamanaka, who makes the disc and plate, with Makiko Tada, and I'm the only non-Japanese member of the Kumihimo Society in Japan. And I teach for the Kumihimo Society in Japan whenever I go. And so um, between the two of us, we had some really nice um, contacts and very, very good friends who help us on our trip. So we often have Japanese people accompanying us to the places we go. And they are really generous with wanting to show everybody what they know about Japan. Kim, do you have anything to say? No, I, I, well, just that when we met up in Kyoto, we didn't really have a plan to do this, but no. I think we just started walking around going, we could do this. <laughs> and we looked at hotels, we did just kind of, and came home and told our husbands, we're doing a tour to Japan. <laughs> and we had it the next year. <laughs> right, right. So. And I have been on their trip to Japan and it's absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Thank you. Doris. Yes, Doris was on, I don't know which one you were on, but I don't remember what year it was. We don't, I don't remember any years anymore. <laughs> yeah. do, you, do you have any trips coming up? We hope we do. Okay. We, have, we had it scheduled in 2020 in October. We love going in oh, October. Yeah. And we had one scheduled in 2020 in October. Needless to say, it had to be canceled. We rescheduled for 2021. Needless to say, that had to be canceled. And now we're on for October 2022, and we're still just sitting around crossing our fingers, hoping that happens. And believe it or not, it sold out in 2020. And I think every single person who was signed up in 2020 is still signed up. And we even have a couple people on a wait list because everybody's just dying to go. So yeah. People want out of town. Well, are you going to go this time, Kim? Or are you staying home? Oh, no, I'm going. All right. You got to yeah. Good, yeah. good. I'm gonna go, yeah. I may sneak aboard a plane. <laughs> yeah. so how many people are on the trip? 12? We take 12 students, um, maximum of 12 students. I think last year we took 13 because some we had four people last year who were repeats. <laughs> we get oh. repeats often on our trips. Um, and so we generally try to limit it to 12 students because we have four days of Kumihimo classes with the uh, Kumihimo Society in Japan, myself and Makiko Tada. And, um, but those 12 students, some bring either friends or family with them, husbands, spouses, whatever, because we've had male braiders as well as female braiders. Right. And so I think our biggest trip was 22, Kim. Something and like that, that, yeah. that counted Kim. My husband and goes with us. He has to somebody has to carry the bags. Right. <laughs> he's a Sherpa. Sometimes Kim husband goes. I think this time he's planning on going. Possibly. I love it. So are you going to see any new sites, any new places, or back oh, yeah. to your favorites? Well, back to most of our favorites, but we've added um, Kawagawa to the trip and Nico. Nico is an ancient city that was restored in the last three or four years. Um, so we always try to add some new things. We also have an excursion added to this one to 
Naoshima, which is the art islands of Japan. Um, so that's an add on. If, and we have, I think, most everybody going, though. Yeah. Was interested in going. Yeah. And I think Makiko will be going with us, too. <laughs> so she's never been there. Makiko always says I take her to places in Japan she's never been. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Well, we tend not to be a tourist in our own cities, it seems like. Well, yeah. True. But um, yeah. so, that, so that's it. Keep your fingers crossed for us that we get to go this year. We're really hoping. Absolutely, we will be for sure. We want to see the pictures and you know, and we want to hear the stories of your travels. Since we can't all afford to go, or you have to have a pre um pretty good knowledge of Kumihimo, like be intermediate at least to like really get it right versus a total beginner i've had i've had beginners but most people are more experienced you know um what's interesting is that um i we haven't ever done a virtual tour we we probably should put something together kim a virtual of our i think trip. you should we'd be interested yeah. in seeing it yeah because we go to some really great places like we went to the uh, we we charter buses sometimes we try to take public transportation when we can the trains and buses and things but when it's too difficult to get to like five train changes we charter a bus and so we last couple of trips we've gone up to near the base of mount fuji which i can't remember the name of the town but we go there mainly not to see mount fuji but to see uh a museum that features uh, the most amazing kimono exhibit you've ever seen. And it's all a man who dedicated his life to bringing back a form of shibori, shibori that had been lost. And he studied in a museum fragments to bring back this technique. And he was the first person who had a living who was living who had an exhibit at the smithsonian museum wow and yeah he, he, he's no longer alive but there's a museum he built to house his 60 kimono kim something like that i don't think everything was on display but um yeah it's a phenomenal ichiku kubota kubota is the name his last name so if just get a chance, go online and pull up his name and see, look at his kimonos. They're breathtaking, absolutely breathtaking. And bring you... tears to your eyes. <laughs> I'm sure. Kim, tell him the story of standing next to the kimono crying yeah. and you look over. I was crying, I was so moved. I was crying and I look over and there's a woman standing about four feet away from me. She's crying too. We both just grab each other and hug each other and just cry because we were just so moved with with what this man had done. It was just incredible. I mean, I was crying when I before I even saw the kimonos when I watched his video. And he yeah. got what he did. Um, yeah, at the museum they have a video of him and and what his whole thing was. So yeah. yeah. It, it, it's pretty moving. So we always look for things like that that are kind of off the beaten track that not everybody sees or goes to. And, you know, it, it's a pain in the neck. It's an all day trip to go there, but we feel it's well worth it. Sounds like a once in a lifetime experience to me. Yep. Yep. There's actually a couple of books in print of his work. I have both of them <laughs> um, that you can buy because when he did the e exhibition at the Smithsonian, uh different publishers made books about his work and you can buy um beautiful like coffee table books because the photography is amazing of these so cool oh anyway so yeah someday kim we ought to put together a virtual tour of japan video yeah. i think uh, maybe if we don't get to go this year we can do that <laughs> spend our time doing that <laughs> It's almost as good going over the memories. Mm, definitely. 
definitely. We've had some good ones. One of my favorite memories is when the Japanese people are always amazed at what we know. <laughs> Like we, for instance, we were in Hiroshima last time and um, we were going to Saki Town and Iwal Yamanaka and what's the guy's name at Tulip, Kim? The Ken grand, not Kenji. Uh, the, son, the son of the president of uh, Tulip was with us. They did, they were going to go with us on this little excursion. We were going to Saki Town. We were going to do Indigo Dying and do some other things. And I had already re researched it because it's not easy to get from our hotel to the bus station. And so they said, come on, let's get taxis. And I go, no, there's, there's like 25 of us counting Iwao and everybody. And I said, no, we'll, we'll, we have to wait for 10 taxis or more. I said, no, we're taking the bus. And they're going, no, the bus doesn't go there. The city bus is right outside our hotel and we can all get on the same bus. <laughs> and, and they're going, really? <laughs> <laughs> and so we get on the bus we go to where we need to go and and what's his name from tulip goes how do yeah. you know this <laughs> well that's because kim is the best tour guide you know and you're the inspiration for adventure and between the two of you oh my gosh yeah adrian adrian is a master navigator she can get you anywhere you need to go no matter what the language is. Yeah, she's incredible. <laughs> yeah, when I was in Iga last time, we they had chartered a bus from the conference in Iga and it was gonna stop at two places, at my hotel and the um, train station. Don't tell anybody, but the reason it was stopping at my hotel is because Makiko's husband chartered the bus <laughs> and he made sure me and my friends got to go there. So people were trying to figure out on the bus because it was like a two hour ride. Well, where should I get off? Should we get off at this hotel or should we get off at the train station? What's easier? And so they all gravitated to Makiko and would say, Makiko, where should I get off? Well, you, this is my hotel. And she'd go, if you need directions, please go ask Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> she goes, I don't know. You have to ask Adrian. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, that's how good I've gotten with the transportation in Japan. Very good. Yep. I just make all the arrangements. She gets gotcha. us where we need to go. Gotcha. Well, it's a great team. Eventually, I will get there. It's on my bucket list. Whether it's a Kumohimo trip or whether I just charter you guys as, you know, my tour guides. <laughs> there you go. We're available. And you we're Toho, Rochelle. Well, that's what I've been working on for 15 years now. The invitation's oh. there, but we need to have the reason. And we also need to have some more like group support from Team Toho. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's one of the things on my website that if you become a Kumi U member, the, my very first video is a virtual tour of the Toho bead factory where you get to see the beads being made. See, which is on my bucket list too. So a virtual tour is better than, you know, oh my gosh, because you get that, you get the behind the scenes when you go. Right. Yeah, they don't offer the tour we get to anybody. It's only because of Kim's long relationship with Toho that yeah. we get the tour we get. And so, because I know Hannah took a tour when she went. And right. so, um, but yeah, I don't know if she, well, special friends, you know, and Hannah, I'm sure, is a special friend and got the behind the scenes tour. What's really funny is the first time I went on the tour, Kim had already been before me. And the we were wearing, of course, beaded jewelry at that point. And um, the, the Toho, the managers at Toho, the factory managers had asked to see our jewelry. And we were so flattered, of course. Oh, here, let me show you, <laughs> you know. Well, then they start doing this, looking at it. And we they weren't looking, admiring our work as we thought. <laughs> they wanted to see the durability of their beads yeah, because okay. they only got to see their beads new. They didn't, they don't ever get to see their beads 
once they've been beaded and used and braided and worn and they really wanted to see what it looked like after they had had some wear and tear so did they hold up to their standards of oh, what I they think, thought oh yeah i think so yeah yeah that's me yeah. I know Ewa has taken some micro pictures of beaded jewelry at the shows that, you know, just to see what they look like under almost a microscope. And they, you, they were so perfect and pretty, you know, and then some of the check beads that might be next to it, you could see the flaws in some of the check shapes or finishes, but the Toho beads were always, you know, I mean, they look like, you know, pumpkins. They were so big on some of these photos <laughs> that EWOW was doing. It was really amazing. And they're size 11s and 15s, you know. And well, it's like when I wear my magnifiers sometimes when I'm beating, it's like, that's an 11? <laughs> it looks like an 8, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. This has been so much fun, you guys. Well, thank you for inviting us. We really, really did enjoy it. I speak from both of us, Kim, because we're partners. We, we understand each other. <laughs> Does anybody have any other questions? Wow. Well, it's okay. a pretty, you, I mean, we've got a ton of thank yous, thank yous, thank yous. Oh my God, this was amazing. They put up in the comments in the chat, the links to everybody, all the artisans and the museum you were talking about. So if anybody wants to look for all those links, Hannah put them all in the chat for you so that everybody can follow. Well, I hope everybody understands a little bit more about Kumi Himo and has a better appreciation for the medium. And um, if you have any questions about the Kumi U Club, there's lots of information on my website, or if you have some specific questions, you can email me. And my email is agaskell at me.com. I have several, but that's the short version. That's the easiest. You don't have to worry about how, how do you spell Adrian? <laughs> if you can't remember what that is, we did put that on the umbs.org website right underneath Adrian's portfolio bio. And it's got the other links there too. They're all on the website and the Facebook page. So we will, everybody can find you in the future, hopefully. And, um, I'm just so excited. And then we'll work on Kim and hopefully we can get Kim to uh, teach a Saturday. Let's be live with us. We're still trying to convince her. So <laughs> it's so much fun. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I know. But otherwise, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. And Our I'm pleasure. inspired. I hope everybody else is too. And so enjoy okay. your Kumo Himo tonight, everybody, if you're dreaming. And I really, I can't get that image of her machine out of my head, the way it's <laughs> all braiding and braiding and braiding. You can do a YouTube search for Makiko Tata braiding machine. And um, that was amazing. Up. Yeah, comes up. Just so cool. I mean, because that's the our goal, right? Is to build the beating machine. So when you wake up in the morning, the project <laughs> is all done. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I love the process as much as the as the end result. <clears throat> yeah. And but the thing is about Kumihimo, one of the reasons I failed to mention that Kumihimo was such an attraction for me is because when I first learned it, I was doing art shows and the jewelry I was creating was so time consuming, as you know, how time consuming bead weaving is, right? Well, Kumihimo is lickety split. It is so fast, you know? So I could do Kumihimo and then just add bead woven elements to it and get an inventory out there because it was really hard to get an inventory for an art show when you know, I was doing these juried art shows and I had to have inventory and boy, Kumihimo changed all that. And that was my, at the beginning was probably my biggest attraction to it was how quick it was. But later it was the engineering and the process and how much fun it was to keep inventing new things. Well, yeah, you made a bracelet for EWOW in like a half hour, 45 minute demonstration <laughs> at the booth, you know, and it was done. <laughs> 
I know. That, yeah, I forget what year I did that. I did that on purpose because I was like, okay, let we me show you how fast it. It Yeah, we were trying to see. Yeah, I can't remember what year it was either. And I would, let me just glue on the clasp. Ew, wow, here's your project. <laughs> <laughs> And so it probably he, fits him now because when I made it for him, he was a little heavier and it was a little tight, but now he's lost so much weight. I bet it fits him. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah. So yeah, well, if we do bead fast, that's the whole idea is we want to have teachers back in our booth again and everything. So if we really do it big up next year, we'll let you all know and maybe, um, We'll see how it goes, but we want to get back into it and we want our team Toho designers, you know, to feature. So otherwise, if we can't do it at the shows, we're going to do it on Team Toho Facebook page live. So we want all the Toho designers to know we have not forgotten about y'all. We still support you and we want to figure out how to do it. So if it's not at a show, we're going to do it virtually. So great. Wonderful. Well, Toho has always been very supportive of me. And I think all their designers. So absolutely. So um, so yeah, we we love you. And so welcome. Thank you to from the UMBS Bead Society. And so I'm sure many of our Kumuhimo people will be strolling into Kumi U, you know, as well. Because once you get addicted, obviously, you know, you can't put it down. Right. So and it, it's such a good companion to bead weaving. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to give up bead weaving to do kumihimo. They really do work well together. Absolutely. So what's one more part of it to just keep the brain, you know, excited? So. Okay. Well, thank you. Arigatou gozaimasu. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are going to stop the recording.